Hi, um, so I'm here today to talk to you about three different teaching strategies that you can implement really right away today to improve your teaching. This can be great for new teachers who are just getting in the hang of it or in the swing of it, um, but it's also a great reminder for veteran teachers who just need a little refresher, a little motivation. <clears throat> so I'm gonna get right into it. So the first one I wanna do or talk about is entry tickets. So in my school, in my seven years of teaching, I've done a lot of bell work. It gives me time to just take attendance, talk to kids who've been absent, get things set up, et cetera. You know how it goes. Um, but I've struggled with what to do with that bell work. I don't want to grade it. I don't want to collect it. But I do want to find a way to use it to understand, like, if my students are understanding the concepts. So typically, my bell work questions, for example, will be a review of something we learned the day before. Um, typically the biggest takeaway, like what do I really need them to know? And then I'll just check in on them about that one thing. Sometimes it's something lighter, but ideally that's what I do. Um, but since I've decided in the last couple of years to stop grading them, um, because I don't really believe in grading like for completion, um, I had to find other ways. So there's like aggressive progress monitoring, which I can make another video about. There's a lot of ways, but they all took work and I'm trying to eliminate the amount of work I have to do because you know, we're all overworked. So entry tickets. So students will come in the room. There will be a bell work on the board and I'll either hand out post-its or have them on the desk or smart teacher trick. They should know where the post-its are if there's gonna be a day where they have this. So you have one set place. For me, I have a handout rack. Let's see if I could show you on the table over here. So that right there is my handout rack. I'm really good at this. Um, but if I put them by the handout rack, then they know where they are. For example, if we do this day after day. So they'll grab a post-it and then they need to respond to that bell work, but put it on the post-it and then stick it to a board. If you don't have a gazillion post-its like I do, you can have them write directly on the whiteboard. They love using the whiteboard markers. You can have them write on an anchor chart, whatever works for your room. Um, and then once you've done, you know, whatever you're gonna do during bell work, take attendance, et cetera, you then go over it. And this is where it kind of makes it more engaging. I pick just random ones off the whiteboard so my students will stick these to the whiteboard and I'll read it out loud. And I'll say, do we agree? Do we agree disagree? And a lot of times I don't even have the students write their names on it. I can see who does it and who doesn't do it. You kind of know your students by that point, but you can have them write their names. But I wouldn't share it because you don't want to embarrass them or shut them down. So I'll just read the statement they made, the response to the bell work. And then I'll say, okay, how do we feel about this? Do we feel like this was a good response? Do we feel like this was inclusive of all the details they needed? What do we feel like this is missing? You can ask different questions based on what the response is. And then the class responds to that, right? So like, oh, that one's really good. They just forgot this one thing. Or that one's not accurate at all. So we can kind of also identify some false um, ideas when we do it that way. So that's entry tickets. There's one strategy. The second one, hopefully you've heard of, but maybe not, is 10 and two. They, there's a myriad of different ways you can say it. I think it's 10 chunk two, I don't know. I call it 10 and two. I don't always know the right language for everything. You're just gonna get the real with me. Um, but 10 and two is something I've been doing since probably my second year of teaching, where when you're making a lesson, when you're um, like putting it all together, you really cannot be lecturing for more than 10 minutes. And especially I'm a social studies teacher, you know, we're very content heavy. It's a lot of information we have to get to them somehow, some way, some form. And a lot of times, ideally we're not lecturing, but there are days where we really just need to lecture. And as an adult, I, I can't even, and I love school, I can't sit there for more than 10 minutes and retain any information much longer than that. I need to be doing something somehow to be engaged. For me, taking notes is enough, but for students, it really isn't. So the 10 and two idea is that you lecture for up to 10 minutes. I honestly don't go that far. I probably do closer to like six or eight minutes. And then you give them two minutes to process that information. And that can look a lot of different ways. So maybe they're just responding to a question on their worksheet, or maybe they're doing think, pair, share, where they're turning and working with their partner to answer a question or to discuss something. Um, a good idea is to put in a uh, question in there that makes them have like a little mini debate about it that you know that you'll have different opinions on so they actually care and want to share. Um, I don't if you saw when I turned my kids sit in groups. I love it. It's five groups of six for the most part if my class is small enough. Um, and I just have them discuss at the group and a lot of times what I'll even have them do is say like okay 
some representative, because you always have one talker at the group, needs to summarize like what the table decided on or like what their final outcome is or what their biggest argument is. Let's say they don't agree on something and be like, okay, well, these are the two sides we're discussing and you have a representative share. And I don't call on every table because it's 10 minutes to two minutes. So I'll give them like a minute to talk and then we'll share for a minute. And we don't have time to go through every table, but I do change it up so they never know which table I'm gonna call on. That way they have to be prepared. Um, I don't like to cold call or popcorn call on students, ideally, if I can avoid it, because students don't like that. They don't perform well under that situation. Um, that's on me, though. That's on you. All right, so that is 10 and 2. So throughout your lesson, you'll do up to 10 minutes of teaching, up to 10 minutes of whatever it is you know that you're talking about, that you're lecturing, that you're showing them, and then you take a two-minute break. And that two-minute break allows them to process, to get engaged with each other, to speak for a minute because they're kids. Um, and you can even like kind of review and so that can help you understand like okay in that 10 minutes did they get that information or are they still confused do I need to recover that information um, so it's actually really helpful for you and the students it's a double win um, the last one's a little harder to explain it's just student-led teaching um, student-led learning so I have an example my kids are learning about classical Rome right now and for my course it's really um, like skill-based and not as much content-based. So my students are working really hard to learn how to analyze sources. So this example is two maps, but sometimes it'll be text or um, an image or a map or whatever. Um, and they need to analyze it and they struggle with that. They're freshmen, they are not always exposed to maps. I mean, they should have been in middle school, but I'm not a middle school teacher, so I don't really know what's going on there. But they struggle with analyzing these sources. So the first thing I have them do is on their own, I give them the information. So if whatever it is you're teaching, give them a blurb, give them an excerpt, give them a primary or a secondary source and let them look at it. And that's how they're gonna start that lesson. And they jot down initial observations. So this is a college board type strategy. Um, and it's just their initial observations. And I have been like teaching them all year how to do an observation. So when you first see something, what stands out to you? What's your initial like? input what's your initial idea whatever my words are not coming through this morning um and then i say like okay it's what do you see or what do you think what does it make you think about does it make you does it remind you of something we learned yesterday or in this course um does it remind you of something i don't know in your personal life and then what do you wonder so is there a question you have it doesn't have to be all of those but like of those three things what do you see think or wonder um something needs to come out of that so they jot down their observations and then we'll discuss that, right? So, hey, what stood out to you? What did you notice? And I always challenge them. I'm like, you should try to write something that you don't think the person next to you is going to write, something with original thought. Um, and I have to remind them of that every single time, but you do that because otherwise they'll be like, I see a map. Mm -hmm. I see color on the map. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, you know, my third grader can say that. I want you to say something and you got to challenge them a little bit. Um, and then once they're done with that, I just still don't teach. I go right into questions. So I'll ask one or two questions and observe and analyze questions about that source to make sure they really understand it. So for example, this one, they looked at a map of the Roman Republic and I had them on the board much bigger and more clear for them to see. And then they looked at a map of the Roman Empire. They did observations for each one, one right after the other. And then I asked them, based on sources one and two, how did Roman territory change over time between 500 BCE and 100 CE? So they have to analyze the maps. They will have to really have to think about it and look at it rather than just like write down, I see borders. Um, and then I'll ask a second question. I examined the Roman Empire map. So they're going back to one of them specifically. I asked them, how did geography likely affect where the empire did and did not expand? And this asks, has them recall information we've discussed already about geography. So I'm tying in old information that they should have a foundation on. So this is student led. I'm not really teaching them anything at this point. I'm not really lecturing. I've provided the stuff for them and they're using that information to really answer questions, to come to a conclusion on their own. I do discuss their responses with them as a class. I do have them share out and lead out, um, but they're really the ones digging into the information on their own. If after this, you know, I go into a little more lecture and go in more depth and explain it, great. But at least they had some part of the class where it was student led, where they're the ones looking for the information, where they're the ones trying to answer the question without me just feeding them information. I think in social studies, especially at the secondary level, um, especially in the beginning for me, it was really easy to just lecture, lecture, lecture. I like to talk, so I like to tell stories. History's fun, um, but they check out, they tune out. So 
entry tickets. Boop. Look, I got my three little ones here. 10 and 2 chunking and student led. So hopefully that helps. Leave a comment if it did. Follow me for more information. All the stuff that they say. What is it? Subscribe. Click that bell. I don't know. I'm figuring it out. Bye.